Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 485, Sit Down and Put the Tea to Draw. This episode of Craftlit is brought to you by its listeners. Many thanks and much gratefulness to all of the listeners who have gone over to patreon.com slash craftlet and pledged their support to the show. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? I hope you are well. I have discovered a new cleaning thing (laughs) because I'm still on a rampage, but I hate the smell of sponges. I found silicone sponges and they really, they really work pretty well. I am putting a link to these in the show notes. There's no affiliation, yada, yada, but I just have to share because they make me so happy and they don't smell at all. Yay. And I know you can put sponges into the dishwasher or you can put them in the microwave or you can soak them in red, white, in white vinegar. It doesn't seem to matter to me. I can still smell mildew on them. Kind of like when I get them out of the wrapper, they just give me the heebie-jeebies. So I now have a little scrubby brush and I have a little silicone sponge. So that's good. And I have finally achieved clarity on the shower door. I know you're thrilled, as am I, to find out that it it only took hours and hours and hours of scrubbing over two months. But I was finally able to get it clean using, well, I used a whole bunch of things. But the two that seemed to do the most good were Barkeeper's Friend Powder and a product from a website, uh, I think it's simplygoodstuff.com. They have a liquid, and you, you have to shake this sucker up pretty darn well, scum off shower cleaner. This works on both soap scum and hard water stains. So it is mildly abrasive, but it's very mildly abrasive. It doesn't harm the, the glass at all. And uh, and I've come out of this without harming the glass. So yay. But yeah, I think I was talking to somebody earlier this week on email, and I think it's up to about six hours total scrub time, off and on. I mean, you know, it was half an hour here, 15 minutes there, but it was a lot of nights of scrubbing. Thank goodness for podcasts and audiobooks. It made it all better. So I will have links to all of these things for you in case you find yourself in a similar position. Now, we have a lot of Anne of Green Gables commentaries right now. And we have one chapter, chapter 16. But I have a a lot of really nifty things to share with you. The first is I was emailing back and forth with Margaret. Margaret is a longtime listener and she wrote, she wrote a very sweet email, but she mentioned that she had gotten to go to Prince Edward Island herself years ago. And I said, oh, can you write back and tell me what, what it was like? What do you remember? What what was it like to be on Prince Edward Island for those of us who aren't lucky enough to either live there or to have gone there before? Here is what Margaret had to say. She wrote, I first read the Anne books when I was a child, and I visited Prince Edward Island when I was 30 with a husband and a small child of my own. So I had a long time to build up a mental picture of this paradise, and of course the reality wasn't an exact match. It was still a lovely visit, and I'd like to go back again someday. I had built up mental pictures of the beautiful deep woods I imagined from the books, and I honestly didn't see much of that. We spent most of our time in the beach areas with our daughter. But the beaches near Cavendish, which is the place that was the model for Avonlea, were really lovely. All the beauty of a sandy ocean beach with fairly gentle waves so that I wasn't afraid to paddle around with our daughter, even when she wasn't quite two. The sand and rocks really are reddish, and we drove along many red dirt roads. That gave it a bit of a foreign, different feel. And we did take drives inland. It's such a small province that you really can see a lot of it in a short visit. I remember feeling that the place had a lovely peace about it, in spite of all the tourists. I took away the impression of lighter greens than the usual landscape where I live, which is very pretty in a different way. The Prince Edward Island economy wasn't doing too well when we were there, so in our drives in the country, there were a few too many old run-down farmhouses. 
but still a lot of beautiful farms. The best part was that the people were super friendly and welcoming. Not just the lady I met in the bookstore, yay, bookstore people, but almost everyone. There was not a lot of that eye rolling about the annoying tourists, which doesn't surprise me. It just seems like Prince Edward Island would be a lovely place to be. And with landscape like that, how can you go wrong? So that was from Margaret. And then I got an email from longtime listener, Lori. She wrote very kindly about my son going to college and all of that. And she's listened since Croton on Hudson. So it's been a while that we've been together. But she also sent a picture of what she was weaving when she was listening. And I am posting it to the show notes because holy smoke, is this thing gorgeous. So Lori, congratulations on the fantastic weaving. Hokey Smokies, that is just stunning. And everybody needs to go see it. <laughs> Craftlit.com slash 485. Wow. We also got a couple of voicemails. We heard from Tara and then from Rachel. Here we go. Hi, Heather. Tara Worcester here. I have some comments on Chapter 15. One, the comment about Anne's nose. Please, can we talk about how adorable noses can be? My family in particular has a very petite nose that has an adorable little curve at the end, like a ski slope. Ours have been remarked as being cute and adorable, and I even had one guy serenade me with a song of my darling nose, which was awkward and adorable at the same time, coming from a pimply 14-year-old to my 15-year-old haughty self. Perfect. I know. Also, the take notice. I think it's like the bathroom stall. If you're looking for a good time, call, insert name and number here. I think it's like that. If you see this person, you need to look and take a good long look because, oh, my heavens, just look at him kind of thing. And then another thing. Can we all stop for a moment? And these super proud knitting aunties that saying one is going to college. Oh, my God. When did he grow up so fast? Because holy poop. He grew fast, fast from Montessori at home, schooling, awkward child to look at this tiny man person you've you've managed to, to raise your spry son into. Congrats. Go you. I can't wait to hear the next chapters. I am thoroughly enjoying Kim reading. And I can't wait to see what adventures your boys get into while they become these man people out in society. I hope you're having a great day. Happy belated Easter. Happy Passover. Happy insert tribe function here. I hope you're having a great one. Bye. Hi, Heather. My name is Rachel. I just wanted to say that I've listened to your show for a long time. And... When I first started listening to it, I was not a crafter, but I did particularly enjoy your version of Sense and Sensibility and et cetera, and I was hooked. But a few months ago, I stopped listening to you on hiatus, and due to circumstances in my life, and I just wanted to, during that time, I became a crafter. I started to crochet. And um, as soon as I became good enough, I remembered your podcast, and then I said, hey, I can listen to this now for the craft news and for the literature. So I just wanted to say that, and also that I'm particularly happy that you're doing Anna Green Gables, just because Anne and I go way back. We, I was a lonely child growing up, and... When I first read Anna Green Gables, I nearly, if not did, cry every chapter just because her, the way she explains, or L.M. Montgomery explains the way Anne thinks and feels was exactly how I thought and felt as a child. And the search for a bosom friend was overpowering after reading that book. And eventually I did find a bosom friend, and I almost fell into it just because one day I realized that Anne of Green Gables was my bosom friend, and that's how much she meant 
to me. The only other way I could describe it was when I, the first time I read Jane Eyre, was Mr. Rochester describing the little thread of their souls, latching them together. And that's how I feel about Anna Green Gables and I. Anyways, I just wanted to say that I love your show, and I'm so happy to be listening to it and um, how much this book means to me and how much you mean to me. Thank you. So, thank you. Lori had said in her email, I can't tell you how many times I've recommended Craftlet to my friends, and I have to say, in response to all of this, I cannot tell you how often I talk about how amazing Craftlet listeners are. I just brag on you guys all the time. So, Anne, chapter 16. We know that Anne has decided not to go back to school and that Miss Rachel Lynn recommended to Marilla that Marilla let her stay home. We get a little taste today of what Anne's life is like while she is staying home. And we have a couple of uh, phrases and terms that might throw you. The first is the title of the episode, Put the Tea to Draw. This is like drawing, you know, if you were, were trying to put a poultice on something to draw an infection out or draw venom out or something like that. Same idea here, except that you have put tea leaves into a kettle and you've poured the water, boiling water onto them to draw out the flavor of the leaves. There is an indication in the way it is phrased that made me think that this is going to be a mighty strong cup of tea. I don't know if that's a Prince Edward Island thing, but I'll bet somebody will let us know. So that's just the, the colloquial get the tea ready or start steeping the tea. You'll hear reference to a raspberry cordial. Now in my life, cordial is usually an alcoholic drink, but these are kids talking about the raspberry cordial. And in fact, there is an Anne of Green Gables cookbook that includes in it a recipe for a raspberry cordial. This cookbook is linked to from the show notes at craftlet.com slash 485. And this is not an alcoholic drink. This is the kind of thing, it's it's almost like making a, a simple syrup, but with fruit. So it's not just sugar and water, it's sugar, water, and crushed fruit, in this case, raspberries. And you kind of reduce that. And then you can add ice water to it, uh, maybe a little bit of lemon to, to make the flavor really pop just a little bit. And you can imagine if you were able to chill it in the cellar or something, it would make a really nice, refreshing drink to have just kind of that light, sweet raspberry taste. So that's one thing. A red sweeting, S-W-E-E-T-I-N-G. A red sweeting is a variety of apple. It's some, some places classify it as a heirloom apple, the way there are heirloom tomatoes or heirloom chickens. These are, are breeds or varieties that are dwindling in number. So red sweetings may still be out there as, as a real thing like Honeycrisp or Granny Smith. I am not sure, but that's what they were back when Ella Montgomery was writing the book. You'll hear a reference to a red hood and blue crossover. The red hood is crocheted, and I have found some examples that line up with something that Lucy Maud Montgomery described in her journals. So it's it's just a black and white sketch. It's, sketch. it's like from um, Weldon's, that kind of a sketch. So I have that on the show notes as well. But the blue crossover, if you have the second Defarge book, What Else Would Madame Defarge Knit? You may recall that there is a pattern by Laura Ricketts. There's the comfort of a friend shawl, adult size, but there's also a child's size as well. This is, as far as I can tell, pretty much exactly what Anne is talking about when she talks about the blue crossover. It's a very specific kind of shawl. So if you look at the What Else Would Madame Defarge Knit book, and you can go to www.mdfk.com, What Would Madame Defarge Knit, look up the Else books and patterns there, and you should be able to see a picture there or on Ravelry, you can search for it. And Laura has both a Laura Ricketts Ravelry account and a stash muffin, her old Ravelry avatar name. 
either way, you can find your way to the comfort of a friend shawl. You can also visit, if you're not on Ravelry, her page at Laura Ricketts Designs, and it's R-I-C-K-E-T-T-S, Laura Ricketts Designs, all one word, dot com. She does amazing work with designs from the Sami people um, up above Finland. Amazing color work. She's just amazing is what it comes down to. But yes, if you want to see a crossover, in fact, I just looked at it on the Ravelry page. If you scroll all the way down to the last picture on her stash muffin version of the comfort of a friend shawl, you will see a blue one on a lovely lady who knit one for herself. And there it was all pretty and everything. So that is what the hood and crossover is. There is a phrase, malice prepens, which means malice forethought. It's a French term. That's all it means is you, you thought about doing something bad and then you did it. You planned to do it. Now you may think at the end of it that this wasn't a very long chapter or a very important one, but I promise you a lot of I think key character information gets communicated in our chapter today. So I am so excited to share one of the funniest chapters with you. Chapter 16, Diana is invited to tea with tragic results. Anne of Green Gables by Lucy Maud Montgomery, read by Kim Zuckert. Chapter 16, Diana is invited to tea with tragic results. October was a beautiful month at Green Gables, when the birches in the hollow turned as golden as sunshine, and the maples behind the orchard were royal crimson, and the wild cherry trees along the lane put on the loveliest shades of dark red and bronzy green, while the fields sunned themselves in aftermaths. Anne reveled in the world of color about her. "'Oh, Marilla!' she exclaimed one Saturday morning, coming dancing in with her arms full of gorgeous boughs. "'I'm so glad I live in a world where there are Octobers. It would be terrible if we just skipped from September to November, wouldn't it? Look at these maple branches. Don't they give you a thrill? Several thrills? I'm going to decorate my room with them.' "'Messy things,' said Marilla, whose aesthetic sense was not noticeably developed. "'You clutter up your room entirely too much with out-of-doors stuff, Anne. "'Bedrooms were made to sleep in.' "'Oh, and dream in, too, Marilla. "'And you know one can dream so much better in a room where there are pretty things. "'I'm going to put these boughs in the old blue jug and set them on my table. "'Mind you don't drop leaves all over the stairs, then. "'I'm going on a meeting of the Aid Society at Carmody this afternoon, Anne, "'and I won't likely be home before dark. "'You'll have to get Matthew and Jerry their supper, "'so mind you don't forget to put the tea to draw "'till you sit down at the table as you did last time.' "'It was dreadful of me to forget,' said Anne apologetically, "'but that was the afternoon I was trying to think of a name for Violet Vale, "'and it crowded other things out. "'Matthew was so good, he never scolded a bit.' He put the tea down himself and said we could wait a while as well as not, and I told him a lovely fairy story while we were waiting, so he didn't find the time long at all. It was a beautiful fairy story, Marilla. I forgot the end of it, so I made up an end for it myself, and Matthew said he couldn't tell where the join came in. Matthew would think it all right, Anne, if you took a notion to get up and have dinner in the middle of the night, but you keep your wits about you this time. And I don't really know if I'm doing right. It may make you more addlepated than ever. But you can ask Diana to come over and spend the afternoon with you and have tea here. Oh, Marilla! Anne clasped her hands. How perfectly lovely! You are able to imagine things after all, or else you'd never have understood how I've longed for that very thing. It will seem so nice and grown-uppish. No fear of my forgetting to put the tea to draw when I have company. Oh, Marilla, can I use the rosebud spray tea set? No, indeed, the rosebud tea set. Well, what next? You know I never use that except for the minister or the aides. You'll put down the old brown tea set. But you can open the little yellow crock of cherry preserves. It's time it was being used anyhow. I believe it's beginning to work. And you can cut some fruit cake and have some of the cookies and snaps. I can just imagine myself sitting down at the head of the table and pouring out the tea, said Anne, shutting her eyes ecstatically, and asking Diana if she takes sugar. 
I know she doesn't, but of course I'll ask her just as if I didn't know, and then pressing her to take another piece of fruit cake and another helping of preserves. Oh, Marilla, it's a wonderful sensation just to think of it. Can I take her into the spare room to lay off her hat when she comes, and then into the parlor to sit? No, the sitting room will do for you and your company. But there's a bottle half full of raspberry cordial that was left over from the church social the other night. It's on the second shelf of the sitting room closet, and you and Diana can have it if you like, and a cookie to eat with it along in the afternoon, for I dare say Matthew will be late coming into tea since he's hauling potatoes to the vessel. And flew down to the hollow, past the dryad's bubble, and up the spruce path to Orchard Slope to ask Diana to tea. As a result, just after Marilla had driven off to Carmody, Diana came over, dressed in her second-best dress and looking exactly as it is proper to look when asked out to tea. At other times she was wont to run into the kitchen without knocking, but now she knocked primly at the front door, and when Anne, dressed in her second-best, as primly opened it, both little girls shook hands as gravely as if they had never met before. This unnatural solemnity lasted until after Diana had been taken to the east gable to lay off her hat, and then had sat for ten minutes in the sitting room, toes in position. "'How is your mother?' inquired Anne politely, just as if she had not seen Mrs. Barry picking apples that morning in excellent health and spirits. "'She is very well, thank you. I suppose Mr. Cuthbert is hauling potatoes to the Lily Sands this afternoon, is he?' said Diana, who had ridden down to Mr. Harmon Andrews's that morning in Matthew's cart. "'Yes, our potato crop is very good this year. I hope your father's crop is good, too.' "'It is fairly good, thank you. Have you picked many of your apples yet?' "'Oh, ever so many,' said Anne, forgetting to be dignified and jumping up quickly. "'Let's go out to the orchard and get some of the red sweetings, Diana. Marilla says we can have all that are left on the tree. Marilla is a very generous woman. She said we could have fruit cake and cherry preserves for tea. But it isn't good manners to tell your company what you're going to give them to eat, so I won't tell you what she said we could have to drink, only it begins with an R and a C, and it's bright red color. I love bright red drinks, don't you? They taste twice as good as any other color. The orchard, with its great sweeping boughs that bent to the ground with fruit, proved so delightful that the little girls spent most of the afternoon in it, sitting in a grassy corner where the frost had spared the green, and the mellow autumn sunshine lingered warmly, eating apples and talking as hard as they could. Diana had much to tell Anne of what went on in school. She had to sit with Gertie Pye, and she hated it. Gertie squeaked her pencil all the time, and it just made her, Diana's, blood run cold. Ruby Gillis had charmed all her warts away, true as you live, with a magic pebble that old Mary Joe from the creek gave her. You had to rub the warts with the pebble and then throw it away over your left shoulder at the time of the new moon and the warts would all go. Charlie Sloane's name was written up with M. White's on the porch wall and M. White was awful mad about it. Sam Bolter had sassed Mr. Phillips in class and Mr. Phillips whipped him and Sam's father came down to the school and dared Mr. Phillips to lay a hand on one of his children again. And Mattie Andrews had a new red hood and a blue crossover with tassels on it, and the airs she put on about it were perfectly sickening. And Lizzie Wright didn't speak to Mamie Wilson because Mamie Wilson's grown-up sister had cut out Lizzie Wright's grown-up sister with her bow. And everybody missed Anne so and wished she'd come to school again. And Gilbert Blythe... But Anne didn't want to hear about Gilbert Blythe. She jumped up hurriedly and said, suppose they go in and have some raspberry cordial. Anne looked on the second shelf of the pantry, but there was no bottle of raspberry cordial there. Search revealed it away back on the top shelf. Anne put it on the tray and set it on the table with a tumbler. "'Now please help yourself, Diana,' she said politely. "'I don't believe I'll have any just now. I don't feel as if I wanted any after all those apples.' Diana poured herself out a tumblerful, looked at its bright red hue admiringly, and then sipped it daintily. "'That's "'Awfully nice raspberry cordial, Anne,' she said. "'I didn't know raspberry cordial was so nice. "'I'm real glad you like it. Take as much as you want. "'I'm going to run out and stir the fire up. "'There are so many responsibilities on a person's mind "'when they're keeping house, isn't there?' "'When Anne came back from the kitchen, "'Diana was drinking her second glassful of cordial, "'and, being entreated thereto by Anne, "'she offered no particular objection to the drinking of a third.' 
The tumblerfuls were generous ones, and the raspberry cordial was certainly very nice. "'The nicest I ever drank,' said Diana. "'It's ever so much nicer than Mrs. Lynde's, although she brags of hers so much. It doesn't taste a bit like hers.' "'I should think Marilla's raspberry cordial would probably be much nicer than Mrs. Lynde's,' said Anne loyally. "'Marilla is a famous cook. She is trying to teach me to cook, but I assure you, Diana, it is uphill work. There's so little scope for imagination in cookery. You just have to go by rules. The last time I made a cake, I forgot to put the flour in. I was thinking the loveliest story about you and me, Diana. I thought you were desperately ill with smallpox and everybody deserted you, but I went boldly to your bedside and nursed you back to life, and then I took the smallpox and died, and I was buried under those poplar trees in the graveyard, and you planted a rosebush by my grave and watered it with your tears, and you never, never forgot the friend of your youth who sacrificed her life for you. Oh, it was such a pathetic tale, Diana. The tears just rained down over my cheeks while I mixed the cake. But I forgot the flour, and the cake was a dismal failure. Flour is so essential to cakes, you know. Marilla was very cross, and I don't wonder. I am a great trial to her. She was terribly mortified about the pudding sauce last week. We had a plum pudding for dinner on Tuesday, and there was half the pudding and a pitcher full of sauce left over. Marilla said there was enough for another dinner, and told me to set it on the pantry shelf and cover it. I meant to cover it just as much as could be, Diana, but when I carried it in, I was imagining I was a nun. Of course, I'm a Protestant, but I imagine I was a Catholic, taking the veil to bury a broken heart in cloistered seclusion, and I forgot all about covering the pudding sauce. I thought of it next morning and ran to the pantry. Diana, fancy if you can my extreme horror at finding a mouse drowned in that pudding sauce. I lifted the mouse out with a spoon and threw it out in the yard, and then I washed the spoon in three waters. Marilla was out milking, and I fully intended to ask her when she came in if I'd give the sauce to the pigs, but when she did come in, I was imagining that I was a frost fairy going through the woods, turning the trees red and yellow, whichever they wanted to be, so I never thought about the pudding sauce again, and Marilla sent me out to pick apples. Well, Mr. and Mrs. Chester Ross from Spencervale came here that morning. You know they are very stylish people, especially Mrs. Chester Ross. When Marilla called me in, dinner was all ready and everybody was at the table. I tried to be as polite and dignified as I could be, for I wanted Mrs. Chester Ross to think I was a ladylike little girl, even if I wasn't pretty. Everything went right until I saw Marilla coming with the plum pudding in one hand and the pitcher of pudding sauce warmed up in the other. Diana, that was a terrible moment. I remembered everything, and I just stood up in my place and shrieked out, Marilla, you mustn't use that pudding sauce. There was a mouse drowned in it. I forgot to tell you before. Oh, Diana, I shall never forget that awful moment if I live to be a hundred. Mrs. Chester Ross just looked at me, and I thought I would sink through the floor with mortification. She is such a perfect housekeeper, and fancy what she must have thought of us. Marilla turned red as fire, but she never said a word. Then she just carried that sauce and pudding out and brought in some strawberry preserves. She even offered me some, but I couldn't swallow a mouthful. It was like heaping coals of fire on my head. After Mrs. Chester Ross went away, Marilla gave me a dreadful scolding. Why, Diana, what is the matter? Diana had stood up very unsteadily. Then she sat down again, putting her hands to her head. I'm, I'm awful sick, she said a little thickly. I, I must go right home. Oh, you mustn't dream of going home without your tea, cried Anne in distress. I'll get it right off. I'll go and put the tea down this very minute. I must go home, repeated Diana, stupidly but determinedly. Let me get you a lunch, anyhow, implored Anne. Let me give you a bit of fruit cake and some of the cherry preserves. Lie down on the sofa for a little while and you'll be better. Where do you feel bad? I must go home, said Diana, and that was all she would say. In vain, Anne pleaded. I've never heard of company going home without tea, she mourned. Oh, Diana, do you suppose that it's possible you're really taking the smallpox? If you are, I'll go and nurse you. You can depend on that. I'll never forsake you. But I do wish you'd stay till after tea. Where do you feel bad? I'm awful dizzy, said Diana. And indeed, she walked very dizzily. 
Anne, with tears of disappointment in her eyes, got Diana's hat and went with her as far as the Barry Yard fence. Then she wept all the way back to Green Gables, where she sorrowfully put the remainder of the raspberry cordial back in the pantry and got tea ready for Matthew and Jerry, with all the zest gone out of the performance. The next day was Sunday, and as the rain poured down in torrents from dawn till dusk, Anne did not stir abroad from Green Gables. Monday afternoon, Marilla sent her down to Mrs. Lynde's on an errand. In a very short space of time, Anne came flying back up the lane with tears rolling down her cheeks. Into the kitchen she dashed and flung herself face downward on the sofa in an agony. "'Whatever has gone wrong now, Anne?' queried Marilla in doubt and dismay. "'I do hope you haven't gone and been saucy to Mrs. Lynde again.' No answer from Anne, save more tears and stormier sobs. "'Anne Shirley, when I ask you a question, I want to be answered. Sit right up this very minute and tell me what you're crying about.' Anne sat up, tragedy personified. <laughs> "'Mrs. Lynde was up to see Mrs. Barry today, and Mrs. Barry was in an awful state,' she wailed. "'She said that I set Diana drunk Saturday and sent her home in a disgraceful condition, and she says I must be a thoroughly bad, wicked little girl, and she's never, never going to let Diana play with me again. Oh, Marilla, I'm just overcome with woe!' Marilla stared in blank amazement. Set Diana drunk, she said when she found her voice. Anne, are you or Mrs. Barry crazy? What on earth did you give her? Not a thing but raspberry cordial, sobbed Anne. I never thought raspberry cordial would set people drunk, Marilla, not even if they drunk three big tumblerfuls as Diana did. Oh, it sounds so, so like Mrs. Thomas's husband, but I didn't mean to set her drunk. Drunk fiddlesticks said Marilla, marching to the sitting-room pantry. There on the shelf was a bottle, which she at once recognized as one containing some of her three-year-old homemade currant wine, for which she was celebrated in Avonlea, although certain of the stricter sort, Mrs. Barry among them, disapproved strongly of it. And at the same time Marilla recollected that she had put the bottle of raspberry cordial down in the cellar instead of in the pantry, as she had told Anne. She went back to the kitchen with the wine bottle in her hand. Her face was twitching in spite of herself. "'Anne, you certainly have a genius for getting into trouble. You went and gave Diana currant wine instead of raspberry cordial. Didn't you know the difference yourself?' "'I never tasted it,' said Anne. "'I thought it was the cordial. I, I meant to be so, so hospitable.' Diana got awfully sick and had to go home. Mrs. Barry told Mrs. Lynde she was simply dead drunk. She just laughed silly like when her mother asked her what was the matter and went to sleep and slept for hours. Her mother smelled her breath and knew she was drunk. She had a fearful headache all day yesterday. Mrs. Barry is so indignant. She will never believe in what I did it on purpose. I should think she would better punish Diana for being so greedy as to drink three glassfuls of anything said Marilla shortly. Why, three of those big glasses would have made her sick even if it had only been cordial. Well, this story will be a nice handle for those folks who are so down on me for making currant wine, though I haven't made any for three years ever since I found out that the minister didn't approve. I just kept that bottle for sickness. There, there, child, don't cry. I can't see as you were to blame, although I'm sorry it happened so. I must cry, said Anne. My heart is broken. The stars in their courses fight against me, Marilla. Diana and I are parted forever. <laughs> oh, Marilla, I little dreamed of this when first we swore our vows of friendship. Don't be foolish, Anne. Mrs. Barry will think better of it when she finds you're not to blame. I suppose she thinks you've done it for a silly joke or something of that sort. You'd best go up this evening and tell her how it was. My courage fails me at the thought of facing Diana's injured mother, sighed Anne. I wish you'd go, Marilla. You're so much more dignified than I am. Likely she'd listen to you quicker than to me. Well, I will, said Marilla, reflecting that it would probably be the wiser course. Don't cry any more, Anne. It'll be all right. Marilla had changed her mind about it being all right by the time she got back from Orchard Slope. Anne was watching for her coming and flew to the porch door to meet her. Oh, Marilla, I know by your face that it's been no use, she said sorrowfully. 
Mrs. Barry won't forgive me? Mrs. Barry, indeed, snapped Marilla. Of all the unreasonable women I ever saw, she's the worst. I told her it was all a mistake and you weren't to blame, but she just simply didn't believe me. And she rubbed it well in about my current wine and how I'd always said it couldn't have the least effect on anybody. I just told her plainly that current wine wasn't meant to be drunk three tumblerfuls at a time, and that if a child I had to do with was so greedy, I'd sober up with a right good spanking. Marilla whisked into the kitchen, grievously disturbed, leaving a very much distracted little soul in the porch behind her. Presently Anne stepped out bareheaded into the chill autumn dusk. Very determinedly and steadily, she took her way down through the sere clover field, over the log bridge, and up through the spruce grove, lighted by a pale little moon hanging low over the western woods. Mrs. Barry, coming to the door in answer to a timid knock, found a white-lipped, eager-eyed suppliant on the doorstep. Her face hardened. Mrs. Barry was a woman of strong prejudices and dislikes, and her anger was of the cold, sullen sort, which is always hardest to overcome. To do her justice, she really believed Anne had made Diana drunk out of sheer malice prepense, and she was honestly anxious to preserve her little daughter from the contamination of further intimacy with such a child. "'What do you want?' she said stiffly. Anne clasped her hands. "'Oh, Mrs. Barry, please forgive me. I did not mean to—' to intoxicate diana how could i just imagine if you were a poor little orphan girl that kind people had adopted and you had just one bosom friend in all the world do you think you would intoxicate her on purpose i thought it was only raspberry cordial i was firmly convinced it was raspberry cordial oh please don't say you won't let diana play with me any more if you do you will cover my life with a dark cloud of woe this speech, which would have softened good Mrs. Lynde's heart in a twinkling, had no effect on Mrs. Barry, except to irritate her still more. She was suspicious of Anne's big words and dramatic gestures, and imagined that the child was making fun of her. So she said, coldly and cruelly, "'I don't think you're a fit little girl for Diana to associate with. You'd better go home and behave yourself.' Anne's lips quivered. "'Won't you let me see Diana just once to say farewell?' she implored. "'Diana has gone over to Carmody with her father,' said Mrs. Barry, going in and shutting the door. Anne went back to Green Gables, calm with despair. "'My last hope is gone,' she told Marilla. "'I went up and saw Mrs. Barry myself, and she treated me very insultingly. "'Marilla, I do not think she is a well-bred woman. "'There's nothing more to do except to pray.' and I haven't much hope that that'll do much good, because, Marilla, I do not believe that God himself can do very much with such an obstinate person as Mrs. Barry. And you shouldn't say such things, rebuked Marilla, striving to overcome that unholy tendency to laughter which she was dismayed to find growing upon her. And indeed, when she told the whole story to Matthew that night, she did laugh heartily over Anne's tribulations. But when she slipped into the east gable before going to bed, and found that Anne had cried herself to sleep, an unaccustomed softness crept into her face. "'Poor little soul,' she murmured, lifting a loose curl of hair from the child's tear-stained face. Then she bent down and kissed the flushed cheek on the pillow. End of chapter 16 that is perhaps one of the most moving ends to a very funny chapter that I've come across. I love it. And I love what we learned about Marilla, because the thing you might not know is that at this point on Prince Edward Island, liquor, alcoholic drinks, had been banned. They'd voted in prohibition for the island. So Marilla made the wine, <laughs> the, the current wine, three years ago. And that was important because if she had made it any more recently, she would have been breaking the law when she made it. She was sort of breaking the law just to have kept it, which explains Mrs. Barry's response a little bit more clearly. Although I don't know if Ms. Montgomery wanted us to give any breaks to Mrs. Barry because she's kind of being a poop. <laughs> and I don't like her very much at all right now. I mean, Oh, I couldn't believe that. If you really think this 
little girl who has come over on her own to apologize and beg forgiveness. I mean, that takes some guts for a kid to do that with an adult, especially an adult they know is angry at them. If you really can't listen to the kid, it's, ah, uh, it just, it's the, the sister story to Marilla telling Anne, you have to confess. And Anne keeps saying, I didn't do it. I didn't take the brooch. And Marilla saying, stop lying. <laughs> well, we've got a problem now because Anne's telling the truth. If she tells you what you want to hear, she will have to lie to tell you what you want to hear. You have put her in an untenable position at this point. And that was one frustrating situation that kids can find themselves in. Here's the other side where you have somebody who, who just won't believe that you could possibly have had an innocent explanation for something. And oftentimes there are innocent explanations for things. Life is weird. Stuff happens. But I am sure for those of us who love books, the other reason that Mrs. Barry might stand out as a least favorite character could, could have something to do with the way that she doesn't like Diana reading and she doesn't like Anne using big words. Boy, did it just stick in your craw when you heard that? Because it sure stuck in mine. Ah, oh, woman. <laughs> she just really, really irks me. But in the middle of all of that, when Anne is telling the hilarious story about the dead mouse in the, in the pot of pudding sauce, I, I was dying thinking about it, first off because ew, gross, and oh my gosh, that's hilarious. But the other thing is Anne, Anne daydreaming, the story that she was daydreaming about was a story that was uh, very likely written down, uh, first by Helen Keller, and it's a, a story called The Frost King. Now, Helen Keller wrote it down, but it turned out that even though people made a big deal about this because she was Helen Keller and Eleven, Later, somebody figured out that, oh, well, no, Hel Helen Keller had actually been read a story called The Frost Fairies, which came from a book called Birdie and His Fairy Friends by Margaret Canby. So she, she had remembered the story just as a story, and she changed it some when she wrote her version down from the Margaret Canby version. Lucy Maud Montgomery has changed it again, but the way that she changed it, I think, is significant. This idea that she was imagining she was a frost fairy going through the woods, turning the trees red and yellow, whichever they wanted to be. Now, in the other stories, there was no option. There was no freedom to choose. It was the frost fairy came in and stopped you from being pretty and green by turning you a color, a different color. And the frost fairy was completely in control of the situation. Anne's generosity of spirit pops up here again. The trees get to be whatever color they want, just as long as the color is beautiful. The rest of it doesn't matter. And this is one of those moments where I think I would love to go back in time and talk to Ella Montgomery and ask her if she did that on purpose, or if that's just the sign of a writer who knows her character so well that it just appears on the page, unbidden, miraculously, out of her head, through the nib, and onto the paper. Because that's just lovely, and so, so perfectly Anne. Just as Marilla's not laughing in front of Anne is so Marilla, but now we have the new version of Marilla too, or the, the expanded version. It's the extended play version of Marilla, because we also see her truly touched and saddened by Anne's pain. And she's very tender. Even, even though Anne is asleep, I know, it's still, I think, a pretty huge step for Marilla. She's gotten her heart stolen by this little girl, and it's beautiful. I also thought that Anne's comment that Mrs. Perry isn't a well-bred woman, and Marilla's response, she's stuck again, right? Because just like with the minister, well, everything the kid is saying is actually true. You shouldn't say it out loud, and certainly not in mixed company, but darn it, if you aren't right, <laughs> the mouths of babes. I love it. I also thought it was hilarious the way Anne, Anne sharing her romantic 
death of Diana. <laughs> this pathetic romance and, you know, the back of the hand. It's movie wasting disease all over again. But it does, every time she brings it up, it makes me think of Jane Eyre. And it's, again, one of those things I want to go back in time and ask Lucy Maud Montgomery. So did you love Jane Eyre or what? Because I'm getting this vibe. I just love that. I also love how funny the girls are in the beginning when they, you know, they put their toes in the correct position and they they have what they think are, are grown-up conversations. And they're just, they're just adorable. I just love that. So the chapter ends on a sad note, I know, but it was a very funny chapter. And I would like to believe that things will not stay quite this bad forever for, for our little Anne. And it, it makes me so happy to hear from, from Rachel and from so many of you who have written in as well, that Anne was that kind of literary touchstone, something that you could go back to and point to and say, oh, okay, I'm, I'm not nuts. I'm not crazy. I'm not a complete isolated person. There is, even if they're not here at school with me, there is out there in the world at least one other person who understands. And I am sure that the letters that Lucy Maud Montgomery received had to have expressed an awful lot of that as well. It's one of the things that makes me uh, happiest about the internet when it works right when it works well, when it works the way I like it to work, how supportive and generous and connecting it can be. In fact, uh, I don't know if you saw, but on Easter night, April 1st, this last Sunday, there was a live version of Jesus Christ Superstar that Andrew Lloyd Webber was there. It was a big deal. They they did it live, one of those live theater things, like when they did Grease or They say they're going to do Bye Bye Birdie. Now um, they did Peter Pan, uh, Sound of Music. Well, this time they did Jesus Christ Superstar with John Legend, whose voice is like butter. Uh, John Legend playing Jesus. And the guy who took over for Leslie Odom Jr. in Hamilton. So he had been playing Aaron Burr in Hamilton. It was very interesting watching the show because it was beautifully done. I don't know. If you know the music to Jesus Christ Superstar, you should know that Andrew Lloyd Webber was 22 when he wrote it, and Tim Rice was 26 when they put this masterpiece, concert masterpiece together. It's really kind of an unactable play. There's no spoken words. It's all sung. So it's a a rock opera, but it doesn't really work terribly well as a show show when it's live and in a theater. However, it works pretty darn well as a televised theatrical event. There's a lot of stuff that they can do with cameras where the the cameras actually kind of become a character at various points during the show and can communicate a lot of what the, the music communicates in a way that you really can't actually do when you have a proscenium arch and you're separated from the actors. So it was very interesting to watch. And I, and I bring it up because, for one thing, the set was beautiful. The opening guitar riff was played by a 14-year-old, as I understand this. Uh, my son saw this kid in School of Rock on Broadway with his school. So that was impressive. And then, you know, the, the singing, the voices. It's the first time I've ever seen body mics, not Fritz, during a show, except for Hamilton. They didn't Fritz then either. It was just stunning. And perhaps the most awe-inspiring crucifixion resurrection moment I've ever seen. And I've seen a lot of Godspell and a lot of Jesus Christ Superstars. And this one blew everybody out of the water. But that's not why I bring it up. I bring it up because the Twitter feed, hashtag, if you were just following the hashtag, and you can still go look this up, uh, go to twitter.com and then in the search bar, put hashtag Jesus Christ Superstar Live. All one word. Scroll down. Let them all load. They're going to load for a long time. Then scroll all the way down and start reading. People were tweeting in real time during the show, and their comments were almost universally beautiful, supportive, beautiful, 
sharing, generous, happy, and towards the end of the show, more than a few people tweeted, I've been reading all of these tweets as I, as we've been going during the commercial breaks in the show, and this is what I wish the internet was all the time, because it was it was beautiful, and people were so funny, but not funny, mean, snarky, just honestly, hilariously funny. Uh, I was sharing a couple of them with Kim Zuckert, and one of my favorites was towards the end of the show, somebody tweeted, whoa, 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 wait, they can't, they can't kill the, they, they're not going to kill the main character, are they? And of course, it's the story of Jesus. So there is the joke. And then there was another one earlier because Judas is, he was in a sleeveless, sleeveless vest and I think black leather pants. And somebody tweeted about, if only the nuns had revealed that Judas was wearing clothes like this when when she had been in catechism class, she would have paid a lot more attention. And uh, it's it's one of those know your audience moments. There were some snarky comments from people who were not happy to see a bunch of Williamsburgian tattooed kids bouncing around as Jesus's followers. But I have to say, they do a pretty good job of being ecstatic in the religious sense. And, uh, and certainly they can keep up with the music, whereas I don't think I can anymore. There was a time when I would like to believe I could have been in that show and still been alive at the end, but no longer. Too much. But they are sure full of energy and the music was beautiful and the voices. Oh, and Sarah Bareilles, who was in, still is in, was in Waitress. And uh, she's a singer. She was Mary Magdalene. She, her voice is just clear as a bell. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful job. And they costumed her perfectly. So I'm going to shut up on the whole subject right now. But it was nice to see the internet being what the internet should be, you know, once. So yay. There's us in our little corner of it. And then there's that one Twitter feed. Yay. Positive note. Let's end there. All right. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. A big thanks to all the Craftlit listeners who support the show by being a premium audio member via craftlit.com slash premium or via patreon.com slash craftlit. Your support for the show is what's kept us going since 2006. If you feel like getting free audio pretty much every week, please consider supporting the show by heading over to patreon.com slash craftlit and pledging what you feel the show is worth to you. If you can't support the show that way, consider leaving a review at iTunes or at our facebook.com slash craftlit page or follow at craftlit on Twitter and share the show with your followers too. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. <laughs>